Just stop it. The -the run-of-the-mill, cheesy, humdrum bullshit status quo just tires me out. What fascinates me are the industry disruptors, the superhuman frontiersmen or women who go through hell to achieve their goals. Join me as we meet and learn from those mavericks, rebels, and business leaders that aren't afraid to piss off the establishment in order to make radical change for good. Sponsored by Johto PR, the disruptive anti-PR firm that murders your competition with cinder blocks and cyanide. This is Disruption Interruption. Welcome back, everybody, to Disruption Interruption. I'm your host, KJ, and we're here today to talk to someone who has taken the reins of their industry and steered it off the lame, tired path to venture into unexplored opportunities that have kicked up the dust on the status quo. We're talking today to an enterprising and ambitious business leader with strong experience in founding and working in high growth environments, but with a specific specialty in distressed or turnaround situations. He founded his first business at age 20. He grew to become a nationwide provider and successfully exited in three years. He's an innovative industry thought leader, and we're talking to him today because he is the CEO of a company that powers commerce for the creative economy. Coming to us live from San Francisco, please welcome our disruptor, CEO of Spring, Chris La Montagna, alias The Reinventor. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you for having me. Uh, what an introduction. How do I follow that? Uh, no, thank you. It's, it's great we'll to be it here. Let's send PR people in there. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, super excited to talk today. You know, I'm sure there's so much we can get into about uh, the creator economy, but also just disruption as well of kind of, uh, and my, my point of view, disruption of being in lots of different environments. Yeah, you know, that's the thing I want to talk about is all these different environments and where it led you. But, you know, you're in the creator economy now. And I just just before we get into that, what is your main, most important ingredient for disruption? Yeah, you know, it's I I think, you know, you you kind of touched on it. There's like a main ingredient because I think there's many ingredients, Um, but my and kind of my particular experience really lends itself to thinking about um, the importance of reinvention. And, uh, you know, I'll definitely talk about the the spring story and kind of the journey that we've been on, because I think it highlights the uh, the aspects of the importance of, of reinvention. But when I think about disruption and what that actually means for organizations and companies, um, if you think about so many countless stories of companies that haven't made it, and I'm obsessed about companies that don't make it and why they don't make it, um, it was the failure to reinvent or the failure to spot that things were happening around them that they didn't react fast enough. Um, and if you really go deeper into that source and understand that, like, well, why why didn't the company reinvent? It's because sometimes there's um, there's an issue with not being able to recognize or be able to let go of the past and think about the future. Um, and the spring story, you know, I'll, I'll kind of dive into the, the very short view of the spring story is I talk, I talk over a business which, um, you know, initially was, was to spring.com, uh, you know, t-shirts, print on demand, apparel business and, and turned it into spring. And the way we got to becoming spring, you know, the, the leading creative commerce platform is not by obsessing of who we were, but really thinking about who we wanted to be. Um, and that's quite a hard skill when you get to scale. Um, so it's been quite the journey. Yeah, you know, I agree with you on reinvention. And you're one of the first disruptors who has actually said that. But I have, as their main ingredient, but I've heard lots of disruptors talk about their need to pivot, their need to reinvent. They use different words yeah. throughout the entire process. But this has been your obsession. Why companies haven't made it and the point that causes them to not reinvent. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because you used the word pivot uh, and, you know, kind of feels like a quite a buzzy phrase pivot right? <laughs> you know it's almost like a silicon valley episode yeah we need to pivot you know it's like uh so you know i i, I you hear that quite a lot but i think the difference for me between pivoting and reinvention is in order to to reinvent you've really got to understand you've got to kind of understand your own identity in order in order to which to do that i think pivot sometimes can be like 
hey, this hasn't worked, let's try something else. Mm. Um, and sometimes that can be a negative connotation, that could be a negative thing. Whereas reinvention for me at least, and, and you know, the, the obsession that I have is you've really got to understand the company's DNA, you've got to understand the people, you've got to understand culture, you've got to understand everything about the product. And then all, also to be then confident and comfortable enough to say, hey, I've got to be willing to rip this up and uh, rip this up and rewrite what the future looks like for our business. And that as a, as a skill is super scary. Um, yeah. but it's also kind of quite a free thing. If you can do it in many different environments. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you said that you have to have the confidence to do that. I think what you're talking about for me, when I listen to you is there's a ton of introspection, not introversion, yeah. but introspection, right? And you do have to have the confidence to really look at that. A hundred percent. And I think, you, KJ, if you think about the businesses or the way we run businesses, particularly if you think about VC-backed companies, yeah, that's super hard to do, right? Uh, it's super hard to do because typically you raise money from external parties. You've got this financial pressure to hit these crazy goals, which you've signed up for. So the actual time, space, and care to introspect and to be like, hey, I, I need to think about this for a second. Sometimes you're just on a one-way track and if you don't get there, the fallout could be huge. And, and, you know, that's really what I've spent my career obsessing around is looking at companies uh, from where they are now and then being able to to kind of come in as that, as that initial thinker of going, well, hold on. Like, what about if we thought about this in a different way? And what about if we started to reshape things? Um, and it's, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the way we build companies today there could be a strong argument to say that maybe we don't build companies with enough flex and enough, um, you know, enough ability to kind of really consider what that kind of future looks like. Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. It's kind of like you're changing the paradigm of how you establish companies. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about the creator commerce. Tell me about what you've been doing to reinvent this particular company towards that. Tell me yeah. a little bit about the disruption there. Well, you know, I think the, the best way to tell it and to explain it is, is through the spring lens and kind of what we've done. So as I mentioned, I took over Teespring coming up to five years ago now. Um, and the business I thought was fascinating. So it was a really interesting company. What original Teespring allowed you to do was to upload products onto the platform, create an e-commerce store, push your products to different parts of the internet. And then when someone bought one of those products, um, we would handle all of the fulfillment. So we always think of like an end-to-end -end verticalized commerce platform. But when I looked at the business, it wasn't growing. Uh, it stopped growing. And I was really confused by that because I was like, hey, this is a great idea. Um, so uh, when I joined, I, I really zeroed in on this idea of, first of all, understanding social commerce. And what we mean by social commerce was people buying products directly from social channels. Um, and I was lucky to not, lucky enough to have done, done some work in China uh, prior to joining uh, Teespring at the time. And the, the behavior over there was people were buying directly through social channels. So I was like, okay, this could be really interesting for the Teespring business. And then when I got a bit deeper into the, the business, I looked at some of the data. It was a cohort of users who were just behaving completely different to everybody else. Every time they launched a new product, whether it was a t-shirt or a hoodie or a tote bag or a backpack, they would sell, they would sell out. Um, and it was because they had online communities already established. They were YouTubers, they were Instagrammers, they were bloggers. They had like these online communities. So when I took over the business, that was really our thesis was, hey, let's focus on building the world's leading creator commerce platform. And what we meant by creative commerce is there's this whole bucket of users of new SMB businesses that are digitally native mm -hmm. and we call them creators, right? But they were born online. They were born on Instagram. They were born on TikTok. They were born on YouTube and they're building community for followings that care about what they say. So our platform is really about supporting those creators and how they build their businesses in that way. Um, Creative commerce is a term that we coined is, hey, how could we help 
creators build these commerce businesses to supplement their income as being creators. So as an example, it could be a fitness creator selling workout plans. It could be a, um, a lifestyle creator selling hoodies and sweatshirts. It could be a gaming creator selling uh, small mobile games. Um, and if you think about how broad that potentially go, that's really the business's opportunity. But it's a very fast growing uh, space. The creator economy is uh, huge. Huge, uh, huge space continuing to grow. Um, and we're still pretty early, I would say. Mm-hmm. So just so I understand the hierarchy or the interchange of, of terminology, right? So the creator economy, right, was really started by the social commerce movement. Do the way around. So creator economy is, is really found, or like if you think about like who the enablers are there, you've got your platform, so YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Think about the moment that we put a camera in the front of your iPhone. Mm-hmm. That was one of the enablers to the creator economy, right? Because the camera changed. You know, yeah. we used to watch content. Now we can make content. So that was really the big enabler. So we're talking, you know, 20 years in now. And then the rise of YouTube and all these platforms where you can create content. That's what's established this creator economy. The the really helpful like proxy I have in my mind is if you think about when we grew up as kids, you'd watch TV, you'd watch a hundred channels, you'd watch sorry ten channels perhaps you know of of content with all these uh, TV schedule programs. Now there's a billion hours of YouTube watched every day. I know, crazy right? And that's the creator economy. That's where it began. What's being born from that is platforms recognizing that actually in building these communities a real great opportunity for social commerce it's for these creators to be able to sell to those fans so creator economy has born social commerce and now we look at this idea of creator commerce as a double click into that got it got it okay good that that puts it in scale for me <laughs> so can you back up and let's paint the status quo of e-commerce the way it's been so that people can really, when we get back into the disruption, really understand what's happening. What's been the status quo? Yeah, well, I, I'm someone who thinks in timelines, like, I, I don't know, just, I always think like chronological, chronologically in terms of the way this has kind of happened. And if you think about e-commerce, there's kind of really been certain stages. There's like web 1.0, where we've kind of, you know, we first started understanding that people were willing to put credit card details onto the internet and people would could buy and exchange stuff. There was the rise of like eBay and like, hey, I can sell all the stuff I've got left in my house and I'm building up on that side. And then we had this real explosion of like marketplaces, right? So driven obviously by Amazon and Prime and um, and kind of all that great stuff. In combination with that, we then saw brands starting to realize that e-commerce was a strategy and that they had to have online and offline presence. As that's extended, we've then been able to see... Um, you know, individuals actually start an e-commerce first businesses who have never had, you know, and that's like the rise of a uh, Shopify and kind of those platforms, uh, Shopify, Squarespace, Wix, Big Commerce, all the e-commerce platforms. Now, you know, we're kind of entering this really interesting phase. Um, and particularly if you think about at the same time, if you think about social platforms, platforms like Facebook and YouTube, you know, those business models are driven on advertising today. Yeah. So you upload content and like there's ads to be able to buy products directly. What we're starting to see is those social social platforms recognizing that they want to be commerce players too. So if you think about Instagram shopping or pin, uh, shoppable pins on Pinterest or um, Snapchat e-commerce or uh, YouTube checkouts on Google, what you're now seeing is social social platforms are are really driving this macro movement of content and commerce converging into one place, um, which is super fascinating if you think, well, we all signed up to Instagram to look at people, you know, your friends' photos, right. and now I'm buying all these different brands that I've never heard about. Right, and so, so that's what the status quo has been a few brands, right? A few, like, uh, I don't know, 10, it used to be a few and then it grew, right? Correct. Yeah. Two major brands. And now it's this disruption of this explosion of what? How many brands? Does it matter? Are they even going to be called brands anymore? 
Amazing question. Well, that's the question. If I ask you, what is a brand? How do you answer? How do you answer? Well, I mean, I'm in public relations, so I, you know, you, you can't ask me that. But if I was gonna, <laughs> if I was gonna talk like a consumer, mm. brands to me meant the big brands, the ones mm. that were recognizable, right? Um, but branding, I think, has gotten a whole new moniker today. Like, yeah. I, honestly, who gives a shit what brand you wear anymore? I mean, yeah. I think that's where it's going. I don't know well, if they're right. I, well, the, the word recognition is super interesting, right? So it's like, hey, if you recognize it, then it's a brand. So then like, if I put it into my world, um, is it creator? Is someone who makes a TikTok video that gets a hundred million views in a week? Is he brand? Um, super interesting because it's super recognizable, right? If you think about like some of the TikTok stars or YouTube stars or viral videos, that kind of... So I think there's this really interesting kind of existential question around what is a brand. Um, but, you know, to answer your question around like this explosion or how big potentially could it be? Well, the estimates for it now is this, there's more than likely around 300 million creators in the world. Um, and what, how we identify a creator is we say anyone with an idea and an audience is a creator, which is like super broad, but... I'll give you some examples of creators on our platform. Um, we have DIY creators who are making DIY videos on YouTube about woodwork or metal work. The stuff that like you would really never see, but in fact, their community is so fevering. Like the community love what they create. And you can imagine about the depth of kind of connection that's being created. We have fitness channels, people who are following daily workout plans of their favorite TikTok creator. Um, we have lifestyle channels who are taught, like lifestyle bloggers who travel, um, who are creating, you know, PDF maps that people can buy directly from Instagram. You know, there's so much. When you want to really get into the depth of this, I think we're still so early. So we estimate there's about 300 million creators on spring today. Uh, we have 8 million creators on the platform. Um, so, you know, we've got a couple of percentage points of kind of market share right now, which is cool. Yeah. Um, and growing, you know, we have typically about anywhere between 80 and 150,000 new creators every month sign up onto the platform. 80 uh, to 150,000? Yes, new creators every month. Yeah. So what it demonstrates is, yeah, there is an explosion happening and What's starting to happen, and I think COVID really accelerated this, is people are starting to realize, hey, maybe I don't need to do my nine to five in the same way. Almost like an extension of the gig economy, you know, the Ubers and Airbnb kind of. Now we're starting to think, well, what about if I could create for a living? What about if I could, um, if I could put what I think out into the world or what I care about out into the world? And maybe I could sustain myself in, in building in that way. Um, and we're seeing, you know, a ton of people who are building full-time businesses off that. You know, we've had 134 creators become millionaires from selling on Spring, um, which is pretty exciting and, you know, something we're super proud of. But we also have a ton of people who do this as a side gig and um, something we're excited about there as well. That's kick-ass, 134 millionaires. I hope you guys are keeping those statistics. That's part of it. It's part of it the is. That's the so, story, right? So yeah. cool. Yeah. And even the guys that aren't millionaires that are able to have a side gig or, you know, do their own thing. You're, every disruptor I've been talking to talks about the changes since COVID. And you mentioned that, right? I mean, this is across the board. Besides e-commerce blowing up and people stuck at home and a remote workforce and realizing, hey, I don't, I don't want to go to the office anymore. I mean, what part of COVID fueled that for you guys? You know, I think, um, you know, we did, we did a really deep report to like a white paper into like post COVID and like what it really meant for our business. Um, probably the biggest thing was like, obviously the work components and maybe not going one since go to an office and all of those things, definitely a driver, but actually what we really loved was like the hobbyist enthusiasm that kind of came out through COVID people started like kind of falling back in love with what they did when they were young, whether it was painting classes or whether it was um, DIY or whether it was fitness at home or 
Um, we saw like this real hobbyist enthusiast kind of come back out. Um, and even things like podcasts were fascinating. It kind of felt like there was a period of time where everyone had a podcast. Um, but I thought that was actually, I thought that was actually really cool because it was like, um, you know, people, even in my, my close network became podcasters and I was like, wow, this is an incredible explosion of creativity. And I think above all through COVID, I think what became super apparent to us as a platform, but also just to us as people is like a creative world is a great world. And in fact, that is the thing that we should be trying to power. And, you know, as a platform, you know, we really try and empower the creator in all of us. That's really what we're trying to do is like, everyone's got some kind of passion. It probably feels like we've just stifled it away in boring corporate jobs over the past 20 to 30 years. So that was the thing that like kind of stuck in my mind is something that came out during, during COVID and we continue to see today. It truly is an altruistic purpose. And you don't really think of that when you think of an e-commerce company, but it is the creator economy. It's kind of amazing that through all of this crap that we went through, people can still be creative, right? And, you know, this, this creativity and then maybe the other side of that is like, there's a kind of decentralized borderless component to this as well is like if you really start to think about that is to be creative you don't need to be in a part of the same part of the world you don't need to be in an office you could be you know we've got a couple of incredible creators in like based out of like small towns in india who just like they are just super creative we've got people up in alaska we've got people down in argentina you know we've got people all over the world who like you know like think about this in kind of a borderless kind of creative exchange which stop me if i get too utopian by the way yeah. uh, <laughs> but, but it's true it's, it's better than a dystopia that we live well, in now, right yeah, i'm sure i'm sure there's a dystopian spin somewhere but i um you know it's one of the things that really gets me out of bed every day it's like wow we've got this incredible community of people who kind of feel like we've unlocked the shackles a little bit and i think again coming back to covid you know, it kind of forced that behavior of thinking about, well, what else could I do? Or how else could I express what I'm about and who I am as a person? Uh, I think that's, that's really exciting. Yeah, it really is. And it's not too utopian for me. Don't you worry <laughs> about that. <laughs> okay. Um, I have so many questions about this disruption. Um, but you mentioned one keyword, which is decentralization. Mm. That's happening everywhere, right? This decentralization is like changing um, B2B, B2C commerce, like crazy, right? Yeah. Who are the early adopters of this whole movement? Yeah, you know, it's, it's one of my favorite topics. We, were, we wrote a really great white paper called The Great Decentralization. Oh my gosh, I need to get, don't forget at the end of this podcast, sorry to interrupt you, we need to make sure people know where to get those white papers. Both yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll put them both into links so you can. Uh, but yeah, we wrote this great paper, the Great De De Decentralization, and you know, it, it was such an interesting because we probably started at the lens of spring where we are today. People making money from all over the world, and people thinking about creativity in um, uh, in kind of different ways. But really, we started to look out and look bigger, and we talked about like the role of decentralization when it comes to crypto, when it comes to NFTs, when it comes to uh, financial freedom. Um, so to answer the question about early adopters, you know, closest to us and what we see right now, NFTs are still a, um, a kind of early nascent technology, um, but it's something we feel really strongly about, and we're seeing. Um, maybe like the, the NFT cycle that we're in right now is more like of an art collectible cycle where it's like, Hey, I can release an NFT and someone can own it. But in my mind, what NFTs represent is this kind of redefinition of ownership and digital ownership. If you think about the internet, we haven't really kept up with ownership on the internet. In fact, mm -hmm. everything's kind of be speed free. It's like upload it. If it's great, then we'll monetize it through advertising. But but actually NFTs to me and tokenization to me represents this new rate redefinition of ownership, which I think is fascinating. So I think those early NFT adopters are are you know are early adopters and are, and are potentially pioneers into that space. Uh, They're your pioneers for the creator economy. 
I, I'd say I'd say certainly for kind of ownership. Um, I'd say there's a big there's a big uh, for creator economy more broadly. You know, YouTube really kind of like you know rose as a platform over the past 10, 15 years. There was a lot of early YouTube creators who understood what that was to build communities there. So there's a lot of early YouTube creators who've kind of built strong communities. So they're most certainly early adopters in our space. It's like the oldest platform, uh, people who just adopted it. We see the same thing with kind of Gen Z on TikTok right now as early adopters as well. If people who just recognize that posting content being super relevant on TikTok is something uh, super powerful. Um, and then, uh, you know, in a more broader sense around early adopters, if you think about the the ideals of crypto and kind of what cryptocurrencies uh, could potentially represent, um, I think it's a really interesting question. It's a really interesting idea around decentralized kind of finance and how we pay and how we experience things through the currencies. Um, I agree with you. I agree with you. Long way to go. There's a ton of skeptics. It's disruptive. It displaces lots of different people. But but again, you know, I think there's some really interesting ideals that crypto presents. Um, we were having a conversation earlier uh, earlier in the week around, well, could creators create their own currencies that their fans could use just to buy their products, and what could that do, and what could that mean, and um, so, so we definitely look at that space and, and kind of stand back in awe around some of the incredible adoption that's going on there. Yeah, you know, that was my next question. Where does Spring look at crypto and NFTs for yeah. the greater economy? Well, Spring as a whole really is, you know, we, we've built this platform with like a lot of creators who are building products, building merchandise, building commerce businesses. The reality is like, first of all, we think there's so many more creators to kind of to go and work with. And it's kind of really three pillars to how we want to build our business. So first of all, expanding um, expanded our physical product offering. If the creator's got an idea, how do we then respond to whatever the idea is? So like, let's throw something crazy. I'm like, if a creator wants to start their own coffee brand, we should be a platform that allows them to do that and to really harness any creativity that a creator has. So that's a big pillar of our business. The next one is digital. So yes, NFTs, courses, tutorial. I'm super interested in education. Like could creators be part of the educational ecosystem? So could we could we build more there? And then the last one really is tooling. And, you know, something we're super excited by is this idea of like protection for creators as well. And how do we help them almost reimagine what trademarking and licensing and all this big space, which we've not really understood. How do we think about that? So there's three big goals and big ideas, but something that we're super excited by over the next couple of years. Yeah, those are huge. And the whole thing about trademark and IP, I mean, that's something that's been uniformly abused. Oh, of course. Type of creator, right? So I, I find that very interesting that you say that's one of your main pillars that you're looking at. I just think if you think about this economy, it's this new emerging economy of people and they're kind of like unlicensed on trademark right now because licensing and trademark doesn't work for that, that part of the community. So it's like, well, okay, we could try and force fit them into the old model or we could build something new. Yeah, sounds like you're going to have to build something new, right? Well, it comes back to reinvention, right? It's like, hey, you could think of yourself as a, a merch company or a commerce company or you could think of yourself as a, IP licensing innovator, you know, and that's like the reinvention that might need to happen. Yep. Yep. And, you know, when you have disruptive innovation, you always have a new value network, cuts out an old value network, right? Who's getting cut out or redistributed? Mm, great question. A very politically correct way to ask it as well. Redistribute it is very nice. Um, uh, I am in PR. Don't forget. <laughs> uh, masterclass. Um, I, um, it's, it's such a difficult one because it's still early. And um, I do ask a question around big brands, big established brands. Like if I think about if fans are connecting with creators to buy products, how do big brands respond? And if you think about like influencer marketing, um, influencer marketing to me feels like a paper over the cracks of the real problem. It's like, hey, I'm going to pay pay influencers to talk about my product, 
But if we, we as a platform, and there's plenty of other platforms, are giving tools to creators to create their own product, then what happens to the original brand? Um, so I think that's a really interesting question, which is yet to be answered in a, in a really, in like kind of, in a sensitive way. Um, I think beyond that, um, I've got this kind of idea around dot com, the dot com store. A really interesting question. Like in five years time, do I still go to a dot com store to buy something? Yeah. What, yeah. Where would you go? Well, if you subscribe to social commerce and you subscribe to, hey, I follow my favorite fan or I follow my favorite, sorry, my favorite creator on whether it be Instagram or TikTok or even if I search for it in Google, I can buy, I can buy direct to Google. Does the internet still look like dot com stalls? Doesn't it? I don't know. What do you think it looks like? I, I don't think it looks, I, I think if, if you subscribe to like the concept of Web3, which is this kind of like, more tribal um you know I, I had this great quote which was if web 2 was about going viral web 3 is about being tribal um which i've coined and used many many more times but it's this idea that like maybe you corner pockets of the internet for yourself as a as a creator and as a fan and maybe that doesn't look like dot-com stores um even if you, if you try to explain dot-coms like why does it say dot com and why do you have to go to that destination? It's, it's kind of like, would you design anything that way if it was from scratch? I'm, I'm not sure you would. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think about this quite a lot, probably too deeply sometimes, but. Uh, well, you just need a location in space, whether it's virtual space or like. Right? Possibly. Possibly, right? But then, you know, there's also this connection around, like, does it, I, I, I'm, we're obsessed right now because we're playing with most physical and digital products. We're, we're obsessed about the idea between, between the term digital. So it's like, well, what if it was physical and digital at the same time, which kind of bleeds into like the metaverse concept and kind of like, how do these things connect? So, um, I think there's so many amazing questions to be able to ask from this stuff, but I look at it and go, big brands, I think have got big questions to ask of themselves of like, how do they keep up? How do they keep pace? And I think, yeah, traditional internet kind of web two internet, um, could be very quickly overtaken by web three applications. Um, so they're the things that I would say are politically being displaced. <laughs> displaced, distrib redistributed, right? redistributed. See, now, yeah. It's very interesting that you say this tribal thing. You know, that's happening in the media now, too. You know, we have mainstream media. Big media is going away. And, yeah. you know, my media day rate has been growing exponentially for the last five years, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of, we call it the network media. Yeah. Uh, new aggregators, journalists that were in big media, starting their own, you know, their opinion leaders, just, and they're, they're segmenting super targeted segments of the population, right? So yeah. today people have more ability to get published um, and yeah. be seen by their exact target mar audiences than they ever have before, right? Major opportunities, but it is very tribal. 100%. Well, some stock rights is like one of those ones for uh, journalists of like, I, I think there's a, there's a kind of a, there's a big question. Is, is that good or bad? Um, I'm not sure we know yet if the answer to that. I think it's super interesting. I think again, it comes back to these, that's a decentralization of journalism, right? So of like of media, of understanding that how you connect to the people you're interested in. Um, but it does really ask a question of like, well, how does society as a whole think if we've all got these very small pockets of kind of like thought leadership? Um, but they're unless... all interconnected and interrelated though. Yeah. Have you seen that? Yeah, I think, well, I think there is, right? And like, but it does speak to a question around, and I, can, I come back to like what we saw post COVID is it feels like it harbors creativity, right? It feels like that if, if everything people are going to be like, it's the canvas, the creativity to say, hey, I get to say what I want to say as a person. And I get to say it to the community people who want to listen. It's quite different, really, if you think about traditional media, was like, yeah. The, the business models were very, very different. Uh, well, yes. And there's only a half a dozen companies that own all the media in the world. So that is drastically changing. People get to publish the stories that they want to publish. 
I, 100%. You know, yeah. and you mentioned meta universe. Well, we'll talk about metaverse at another time <laughs> because that's a whole another yeah. <laughs> level, right? We we'll a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe this goes for you with spring, but when did you say, like, that's it? Like, we need to reinvent ourselves. What made you make that choice? Um, most days, if I'm honest. Uh, no, I think um, it's kind of, uh, you know, my, my situation was quite unique. I was brought in to kind of reinvent the business. So, you know, that was kind of the mantra. But even since I was brought in, there's been various different iterations on, um, hey, it's time for like change. It's time for newness. Um, I'm someone who like, I spend a lot of time like doing like external, like outside in thinking. So what do you mean? Uh, I'm always looking out about what um, what's happening in the space, what's happening, macro trends. One of the first hires I made was hiring an incredible trends and insights person mm-hmm. who's totally external to the business. Like she, her only role is to look out and to be and to feedback of like, hey, this is going on over here. This is what's happening in Korea. This is what's happening in Japan. Like and just provides that insight to look out and not look her job is not to look in uh, because the whole the rest of the business is focused on that so I try and like absorb as much of that as possible and that's really been a big driver to me to like hey it's time that we need to shift and we need to change is having that type of insight and then yeah you know having the courage to be able to back ourselves of, of going and making those calls yeah so you actually hired an extension of yourself to go oh, out and feed you yeah yes. that's brilliant what are your biggest challenges right now in your disruption? It always comes with challenges. Yeah, look, you know, I think we're, we're a company with scale, right? We're 350 people. It's a, it's a big business at this point. So, you know, change isn't easy. It's, you know, it doesn't get any easier. It gets harder when you get bigger. Um, so a lot of that is like, we've got great ideas, but it's like, how do you move quickly? How do you, um, how do you make sure that you're backing yourself up with those, with those ideas? And that's most certainly a challenge. I'd say the other thing, and um, this is more of a, a wider point, but we're in like this kind of break net, uh, breakneck speed right now of just like, it feels like things are happening so quickly, um, whether it's new investment rounds of competitors or whether it's like public markets and what's happening there. It just feels that we're at like 110 miles an hour every day right now. Um so you've got to have like a bit more judgment in kind of trying to make that call because that can become super overwhelming. So that's as a CEO, as a company, I think, yeah, it's just having that courage to to back ourselves in in, in reinvention and, and to go back and like to question ourselves in that way. Do you think that this breakneck speed is going to change anytime soon or you think it's just going to get, I hate to use the word worse, but it's just going to accelerate with everything that's changing? It's a great question. I honestly don't know the answer. Um, Check my- yeah, I wish I did, uh, but I don't know the answer. I um, instinctively, you know, growth is an infinite, right? Um, so things can't just keep growing. It doesn't work like that. Um, so you would you would think that there does need to be some form of correction or some form of um, consideration. But um, I think COVID just like sent everyone for a bit of a loop in terms of, we all expected COVID to slow things down, but in fact, it accelerated so many other things. So um, I'm not expecting any change anytime soon. And I think instead what we're trying to do is to gear up to be like, how do we how do we get to pace and how do we keep pace? Um, which is a lot of like building the right team, building the right, right infrastructure. Uh, so that's kind of been more my point of view. Yeah, that makes total sense. Where Where are you expected to go in five years? What's your plan? Uh, as a company yeah yeah you know i've I've got a real deep ambition to take the company public um i think it'd be a fantastic public public company i think we work with these amazing creators we'd love them to share in like the company going public and and like so i'm definitely got a, a strong desire to do that and again given the story of taking over the business and reinvention i think that would be a really amazing milestone for the company but beyond that i'm um i think i'm also interested around internationalization right now we're like still predominantly us based but we've got creators all over the world so we really want to expand internationally um and then um 
you know, I think we've got some other big aspirations around, you know, how do we really zero in and focus on like making it like a positive difference in the world? Um, you know, again, that's why I mentioned things like education or things like financial freedom. I think there's some really cool stuff that we should go and do there. Um, so these are like, you know, kind of nubs of ideas right now. But yeah, I think the company Be Public is a big one that we, you know, we're, we're kind of setting in our, in our sites. Well, that's a, a more different view of taking a company public that I've heard of. You know, you have your creators and you want them to share in it. I would love that. Yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. Because- yeah, we've got some uh, cool plans around that. Um, but yeah, it, you know, our company is built on creators. Therefore, if we take the company public, then creators should be able to win as well. Yeah, I agree with you. And then you talk about internationally, right? Um, and making a positive difference in the world. You know, we have these emerging economies that have growing middle class, right? Mm. You give those creators an ability to get a leg up and expand, yeah. right? these growing middle classes of other countries. Have you ever thought about that, what that would do? Yeah, 100%. We see it, right? We see it on a daily basis of people who are kind of rising from these really interesting places and building businesses. You know, we've got a a creator in India who's made $9 million on the platform uh, uh, based in Hyderabad in India. So, uh, you know, so we see that already. Um, We see that kind of happen in so many stories. Um, I'm someone who's traveled a lot and, you know, uh, I, I definitely feel that the internet was built to be borderless and commerce, I think could be built to be borderless. Therefore, um, I think we've got an amazing opportunity to kind of go and do that and, you know, arming the creators for scale in that way and to build these businesses that way, I think could be, could be really exciting. Yeah, it's truly decentralization, isn't it? 100%. Like, 100%. Okay, so you've traveled all around the world. You obviously don't have a U.S. accent, right? Uh, so <laughs> tell me, me, what the hell yeah. are you, Chris? Where do you come from? How did yeah. you become this reinventor so obsessed with finding why things fail? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm originally from Liverpool in the U.K., um, so, um, the explanation behind my accent is Liverpool's very close to Ireland. Um, so my accent is kind of a mix of English and Irish. That's kind of where the Liverpool accent comes from. I definitely have some trouble when I meet American people, uh, and I start talking, it's like, there's a kind of couple of minute description of explaining where I'm from. Uh, <laughs> originally, originally from Liverpool, moved to London. Uh, I've worked uh, all over the world, really. So I, I lived in London, worked in Israel, worked in Moscow, worked in uh, the United States, uh, traveled to Asia quite a lot. Um, super international and just like one of my biggest passions is travel. So I've been able to really go and experience when I was 19, I went traveling around the world, backpacking around the world, which is probably one of the most formative experiences I've ever had. Um, yeah. uh, so I got to see the world pretty young, which was cool. I think gave me like a real sense of entrepreneurialism. Um, my very first business was actually, uh, painting portraits and selling portraits, mainly of John Lennon and explaining that I was from the homeland of the Beatles. Uh, it was quite an enterprising first business. Um, and then I've always really done my own thing. I I tried university, dropped out of university uh, pretty quickly, realized it wasn't for me. And then I, I started my first company when I was 20. Uh, it's a sports coaching company, which kind of grew to becoming a marketing platform uh, for brands. Uh, so I've always done my own thing, but also had like a ton of um, opportunities to work in fast growing companies as well. Um, and, uh, and, and do different roles. The role prior to spring though was I was working in an investment fund in London. Um, I was, I was hired there to be um, an operating partner to be able to, when we made investments in the companies, to drop into the portfolio businesses to help them grow, uh, which uh, honestly I thought was my dream job. Um, you thought it was? Thought it was my dream job. Um, but I quickly realized that the companies that we'd invested in finance actually weren't really the companies that needed my help. It was, it was more so the companies that weren't growing. Um, and whilst at the fund, I, I developed this real interest in turnaround situations. Um, and, you know, if I go a bit deeper into that, I think coming from Liverpool, which is a super working class place, it's a, it's a, it's a port town, it's a shipping town. Um, 
I think I was always obsessed with this idea of value and see value in things. So when I would see portfolio companies that had had so much money invested into them and yet weren't doing the things that I thought they could do, I became obsessed with like, well, how do I tease out that value and how do I um, yeah, reinvent that company in a different way? Uh, so with, as part of the uh, the work I was doing at the fund, I, I was able to drop in some certain companies, take them over, repackage them, grow them again. Um, and it really has become a passion. I'm obsessed about like this idea of like, what could it be? I don't care what it is, what could it be? Um, and yeah, I think it just comes from a very humble beginning of a single parent family background of kind of just starting in a place where, um, you know, I'm maybe asking that question of well, what could I be in the same way of like, what could, you know, what could companies be? Yeah, that's a cool story. So I, I'm really curious, how did you decide to venture out and do, uh, you know, travel on the world with your backpack at 19? Uh, back when we were too bad. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. I was one of those kids who went to school and didn't really have a sense of like, you know, some people have super vocational kind of, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer. I just didn't have that. And I didn't feel like there was a, a place for, for me. Um, so uh, with my two best friends, I kind of convinced them. I was like, hey, look, I think we should go and do this trip. Uh, and we put backpacks on and we went to uh, Thailand, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Hawaii, and then traveled across America. So we were away about nine months. Um, and had zero, we, all the money we saved, we spent in the first two months. So it was just kind of... Oh, what did you do? Did you work everywhere you went? Little odd jobs? That's for a different podcast. We should okay. Talk. No, no, I, I'm joking. You know, it was just kind of, you know, it really was that kind of like, well, what the hell are we going to do today? How are we going to make this work? Uh, you know, it was really, uh, and it just gave me this sense of like, oh, if I can figure out like what to do today, being in New Zealand with zero dollars in my bank account, um, I can probably figure out anything really. Uh, so I, I came back and, yeah, it was an incredible experience, such a formative experience that gave me that kind of push to be like, oh, you'll figure it out, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually love that. I heard this one time that it's the pirates and bums that rule the world because they're the creators. They can create something and then they'll give you the shirt off their back and they'll have nothing and they'll do it all again. Yeah, right? you know, I, I subscribe to that. You know, I subscribe to that idea of like, um, you know, being in those situations, the other side of the world, no money and no one to contact, you know, that's a real uh, strengthening uh, part of your character. Um, and yeah, I think it's led to a lot of like the way I think about business and the way I think about building companies is, okay, this is where we are. Like, let's figure out what we can do. Yeah. I think that's all part of your DNA as a CEO. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Badass. So, I love it. Yeah. So what are your crazy passions? What do you do outside of spring? Yeah, so I mentioned that travel, uh, travel quite a lot. Um, I've got my family still back in the UK, so I'm always trying to travel. Now that COVID's kind of easing and restricting, I've got a whole list of places that I want to get to um, all over the world. Uh, I So I live in San Francisco, but I moved out of San Francisco. Um, I used to be big in sports. I was a big rugby player back in the day, so I loved playing rugby. I don't really play as much anymore. The black eyes and bruises don't look good for work, uh, so so I, so I avoid that one. But in moving out of San Francisco, so I live in uh, north of San Francisco now, I moved out to the woods, to the wilderness, um, which was something I'd always wanted to do. I grew up in a city. Um, and the community that I moved to has got a local uh, volunteer fire service being Northern California. So I have part-time volunteering in the in the uh, Mule Beach uh, Fire Brigade, which is- No. Yeah, yeah. I've, I uh, I was kind of only in it for the Instagram photo with me with it in the all the outfit, but then, uh, no, it's it's been great actually. And even just that connection to the outdoors, I've, I've become a bit of a, uh, a very amateur woodsman. Uh, really? I've tried to like learn about more of that side, but I do love that side of nature and connecting in that way. What does the fire brigade do? What do you guys do well, about the woods? The volunteer fire brigade. So, you know, if 
cats from down from trees and burning buildings. No, I don't know. But honestly, I like I want to stress volunteer and amateur the keywords okay. to pull out of that sentence. Please don't take fire brigade as uh, I do okay. it. It just is, I most certainly do not. And so, but you're out in the woods. Yeah, so I live on uh, on the coast, so on the Californian, uh, on PCH, kind of up on the coast, uh, on woods and the beach, it's kind of woods, beach and mountains. But it's it's uh, it's a wonderful part of the world. I think when I first moved to San Francisco, I'd moved to the city, but I'd lived in lots of other big cities, uh, and I recognised that actually California, Northern California is really about the access to nature. Yeah. And um, the minute that I moved out there, it all kind of slotted into place and made sense. So uh, it'd be what beautiful. What made you decide to volunteer for the fire brigade? I love that. <laughs> like, what did you, were you driving along one day and you're like, oh. <laughs> you know, do you know what it is? It's probably more than just the, and the, the fire brigade piece. It's, it's a sense of community, right? And I think one thing that I've, I felt again, I think when you pick up and move to another city, um, or another part of the world, you have that yearning for community. You have that yearning to like be part of something. Um, and, uh, and I think specifically, you know, uh, being joining a new community, I want to make sure I contributed to the community. And that's kind of, I think as I progress in my career, I'm really focused on how do I be part of a, a community. Um, something additional that I'm super interested in is like, how do I create uh, opportunities as well. So I set up a scholarship back with the the school that I went to school high school with in Liverpool, which is uh, a scholarship for uh, kids from the school to be able to come out to Silicon Valley. So from Liverpool to Silicon Valley, um, and it, and again, I think that's that sense of like um, wanting to give back, wanting to be part of something bigger. Um, it's just I think a part of like my again my DNA. Wow, that is so gorgeous. You know, I have to say that Spring is truly fortunate to have a CEO like you. Oh, uh, that's very kind. I've known lots of CEOs and I know uh, lots of CEOs. They're truly fortunate to have you. Yeah. That's super kind. Thank you very much. So how can people find you and where do they download these white papers? Yes. So white papers, I'll give you all the links. They're all available online and I'll, I'll definitely provide all the links on, on that one. Um, but within the Spring ecosystem, you'll definitely be able to find uh, Spring white papers. Uh, me personally, I've really developed a uh, my kind of channel of choices really on LinkedIn. Um, I just feel like I can curate the right type of content. You know, I'm less a Twitter user of kind of 240 characters. I kind of like a bit more go to go into a bit more depth. Um, so, um, so yeah, LinkedIn is my channel of choice. Definitely follow or connect and shoot me a message. Um, I try and post there pretty frequently and share lots of content from not just the business, but also my, my kind of perspective as well. Okay, great. So we'll make sure that we have your link to your LinkedIn so people can contact you. Wonderful. Chris, thank thanks you. so much. Yeah. No, yeah. thank you so much. This is fantastic. Really, really love the conversation. Good. I loved it too. We can talk about so many. We'll do podcasts on other things. We have so much we to will. talk about. NFTs, metaverse, you talk, you name yeah, it. Yeah, we've got it. We've got a list. We've got a list of new ones to come. Good. Good. Well, guys, that's it. Thanks for listening to the Disruption Interruption podcast, where we transform lives, change consumer behavior, alter economics, and never accept the status quo. Ciao for now. Because we live in a highly litigious society, with America being one of the top litigious countries in the world, here's our legal disclaimer. This information is not intended to be a substitute for professional public relations or legal advice. Do not disregard seeking professional legal, healthcare, or financial advice, or delay seeking professional PR or legal advice because of something you have heard here. Contact an attorney to obtain advice on any particular legal situation or problem. Use of this podcast or our website or any of its social media or email links do not create an agency-client relationship between Joto PR and the user.